And you can see in the US that the rural areas and the urban areas have begun to divide. So the rural areas have gotten increasingly morally parochial and the urban areas have gotten a little bit more or maybe about the same amount of moral universalism. So there's this growing divide and you can use that to predict things like voting for Donald Trump in 2016 and 2020 over and above the factors that, uh, this is Ben Anke's famous result, um, over and above the factors that political economists would usually use. So the demographics and things like that. How are culture and prosperity intertwined? Can investors identify regions with huge potential for economic growth and prosperity in the future simply based on that region's current culture and socioeconomic fundamentals? Discussing this with us is our next guest, who is an expert in this field, Joe Henrik. He is currently the professor and chair of human evolutionary biology at Harvard University who has previously taught in the Department of Psychology and Economics at the University of British Columbia. Before academia, Joe was an engineer at a General Electric Aerospace. His research uses evolutionary theory to understand human psychology, cultural evolution, and economics. He's the author of several books, most recently, The Weirdest People in the World, How the West Became Psychologically Peculiar and Particularly Prosperous. So we'll be examining some themes of his current research and that book. Professor Henrik, welcome to the show and honored to host you today. All right. It's great to be with you. Just pulling from uh, some of the themes of your book, can you maybe just summarize for us uh, through your research how it is that certain civilizations and cultures have become more prosperous than others over time? Is it a fundamentally uh, uh, economic issue where there's social parameters involved? Uh, was culture a major influence on economic growth over time? Yeah, I mean, that's the case that I make in The Weirdest People in the World. And I start off with the question of why we see so much psychological variation around the world. And I take note that European and, and their cultural descendants in places like the United States and Australia are psychologically unusual in a global perspective. So they're more individualistic. They tend to trust strangers more, more analytic thinking and more focus on mental states, things like use of intentions and moral judgment. And then I link that to the, to the rise of impersonal institutions that we see in Europe and to things like innovation, the kinds of things that powered the Industrial Revolution. So WEIRD in your book stands for Western Educated, Industrialized, Rich, and Democratic Societies. Now, throughout history, as you'll recall, not all rich societies have fallen, fallen into that spectrum. Um, you know, the Chinese Empire was at one point... Uh, wealthy. The Persian Empire was at what one point wealthy. We can go all the way back. Um, all of these have fallen out of wealth and all of out of power. Power has shifted to the West over the last 200 years. Can you, this is a difficult question, but you know, why is that? Why, why, why have we seen the fall of certain empires and the rise of others? Well, I mean, uh, there's lots of, so you can think of um, societies as kind of machines where eventually the parts corrode and start, stop working. So Start, stop integrating so well and fall apart. Um, I was interested in what it was in the Western tradition in the, in the societies that begin in Western Europe uh, that led to things like the Industrial Revolution and the emergence of kinds of institutions that we didn't see in those uh, prior societies. So is there something different about the trajectory of cultural evolution that emerged from Western Europe that led to the different kinds of societies we see now, the, the heavy emphasis on individualism, which you don't see as much in, in those prior uh, civilization societies. Okay. Uh, can we just back up a minute? How do you define culture? So culture is information stored in people's brains that got there via social learning. So from, from the, I think the best way to approach this, and this is what my 2016 book is about, The Secret of Our Success, is that humans, more than any other species, what makes us special is really our ability to learn from others. So this ability to learn from others leads to cumulative culture. And that means that over generations, we eventually end up as we learn from one generation and pass it down to the next, add a few things, pass it down to the next, create technologies, languages, and institutions that no single individual could figure out in their lifetime. So in some sense, our cultures are smarter than we are in all kinds of different ways. And so that's really what has allowed humans long ago, 100,000 years ago, to begin expanding across the globe and eventually coming to dominate all of the world's major ecosystems. And can you maybe highlight a few characteristics of Western culture in particular that have led to the West industrializing sooner than the rest of the world? 
Well, the key element in the story of the West, in my view, was the Catholic Church's um, set of prohibitions and prescriptions that eventually broke families down into monogamous nuclear families. Prior to this period, Europe, like other societies throughout the world and across history, had had dense networks of kinship, which was the focus of economic production and of distribution and really a legal and political identity. But in Europe, the transformation into monogamous nuclear families led to the rise of individualism. So the focus on individualism begins to appear early. So in the high Middle Ages, law changes and begins to focus on the individual. Institutions become impersonal and based around the individual. So this individualism plays a big role in the emergence of Europe, which goes along with things like analytic thinking and the nature of moral judgment and things like that. Now, the monogamous nuclear family, is that inherent in our DNA to live in a family structure like that? Well, certainly not. In fact, the monogamous nuclear families that we see in Europe beginning in the Middle Ages are unusual in a global and historical perspective. So, for example, 85% of human societies have allowed elite and high-status men to take additional wives. Uh, very few families have been organized around nuclear families. These are usually extended families clans, kindreds. Uh, the inheritance of identity has often been patrilineal or matrilineal, but very rarely bilateral. So, so European kinship systems are bilateral, which makes them more like hunter-gatherers than like the societies of India or China or uh, prior places where uh, art, art and technology has flourished. So why do you think that the West in particular has uh, evolved, especially through religious lines, to adopt this particular way of life? Yeah, so the, the way to think about uh, the effects of religion in, um, in society in general and ac across the world, and, and specifically in Europe, is to just think about religions as adopting uh, different religious mut uh, mutations. So there was nothing special or particular about what went on in the branch of Christianity that eventually became the Roman Catholic Church. But for reasons that have nothing to do with the Bible, uh, they began to... Uh, be very concerned about incest. So gradually, an uh, increasing number of cousins had, were tabooed from marriage and mating. And Catholics also um, prevented matings of uh, various in-laws. In fact, the word in-law in English means in canon law. So she's your sister-in-law, your mother-in-law, your brother-in-law, in canon law, which means no sex or marriage. So this began to disentangle social networks that otherwise would have been interconnected, forming collectives and leave space for the movement of individuals and the development of non-kin-based institutions. Um, so it's, it's actually very rare that you would have nuclear families. So do you think that this family structure helped the West outcompete other countries? Yes. Uh, so that opened the door to a whole bunch of downstream developments, which include the emergence of uh, impersonal institutions, which in Europe were initially things like universities, occupational guilds, and charter towns where the notions of individual citizenship are born. And that leads to things like representative democracy and stuff in this bunch of downstream institutions uh, that have now spread across the world. But it begins by focusing on the individual instead of focusing on the clan or the or the lineage, the way, say, Romans did, for example. Okay. Now, Adam Smith argued that the invisible hand of competition was one of the fundamental market forces that led to economic growth and prosperity. Indeed, people's pursuit of their own self-interest led to the common or greater good being achieved. First of all, do you agree with this philosophy? And second, uh, do you think individualism in the West is a cultural phenomenon, really propagated growth because of the invisible hand of competition? Well, I think when you think about competition, well, first, Adam Smith is, is widely misunderstood, I think. And I think that uh, I can, my book is actually full of Adam Smith quotes. And the picture you would get there, first of all, is that there's a human nature that goes well beyond self-interest. So for that, you have to look to his prior 759 book, The Theory of Moral Sentiments. And then when you look at competition, you have to think about its effect on people's psychology. So what we've shown in lots of experiments, and there's new data now, is that actually greater individualism, uh, greater market integration and market participation actually leads people to be more trusting in strangers, more willing to engage in mutually beneficial cooperation with strangers. And so in some sense, markets only work if people are not self-interested. Uh, purely self-interested individuals stop interacting because uh, you can't trust the other guy and, you know, he's, and there's always incomplete contracts. Um, so 
but is there a particular cultural aspect in Western society that has led to people becoming a little more individualistic in their approach to life that has, um, I guess, fostered more competition in the marketplace? Could you make that argument? Yeah. So, uh, and and the, the case I make in the book is once you have the breakdown of uh, into monogamous nuclear families, individuals can move, they can leave land that would otherwise be tied to their lineage and where they would have lots of kin-based obligations. They can then move to the charter towns, which were springing up and growing quite rapidly during the high middle ages. So after the year 1000 in Europe. And that's where, as I document in the book, you see a proliferation of markets. These are not the kind of markets we think of in the modern world, but the kind of thing where the farmers who live in the surrounding areas around urban populations will come like on Mondays or something to trade animals or to trade goods or tallow wax or things like that, wood. And that's where these market exchanges will occur among strangers. And they became more and more popular. And economies became increasingly uh, dependent on interdependent in the sense that people would exchange things in markets. You had the growth of these occupational guilds and whatnot. So these are groups of uh, strangers that get together and then they enforce rules and standards on each other. So if a particular candle maker or baker, or whatever, is not uh, living up to the standards of the guild that all the other his, his fellow uh, bread makers or whatever are living up to, then they impose these standards on him. Uh, and, and this is an impersonal institution rather than the clans which organized other places uh, or the caste system that organizes India. Is it possible in theory to have a command economy, which is the antithesis of individualism, to also prosper? Have we seen any historical precedents of this? Uh, well, I mean, lots of societies that you mentioned that have flourished have had lots of command economies. Um, I so and the thing the thing to always remember. So I always one of my, one of the things I say in the secret of our success is culture is smarter than we are. So it's figured out lots of different solutions to lots of different problems. So the success. The economic flourishing, the technology, you know, reduce uh, reduced infant mortality, vaccinations, massive population growth that begins, say, after 1800. Uh, these are all made uh, possible by the emergence of individualism and the kinds of market forces that we've been talking about. Now, that may or may not be the, the only way or the best way to do things. There could be lots of things that we, we, do, we don't see out there that are possible ways things could be arranged. Uh, how would you explain, let's say, um, a different culture, like, like let's say the Japanese, which um, which is a society that favors collectivism and group thinking, and they've led a very successful um, uh, nation in in terms of economic prosperity ever you know ever since the Second World War. Um, they're leaders of several industries. Their their cultures are vastly different from the West. How would you explain this dichotomy? Well, I think the way to understand a place like Japan is to recognize that there have been uh, massive cross-fertilization of cultural practices and institutions. So one of the reasons that Japan takes off in the 20th century is because the Meiji Restoration uh, around 1880s, the 1880s, had massively drinks in institutions from the West and adopts a whole bunch of Western practices, including the kind of marriage and family practices I mentioned earlier that break people down into smaller nuclear families. And then after World War II, there's another big dosage, in this case, American uh, institutions. You can see that the psychology is quite different because in Japan, there are in many cases a virtual copy of the American legal system. But the way that it, that formal institution operates is quite different than how the exact same formal institutions operate in the US because the underlying psychology is different. So you should think of Japan, and this is also true of China, as uh, you know, not some steady, essentialized culture that is kind of persistent through time, but rather a novel recombination of practices, ideas, and institutions uh, that can flourish in the modern world. Uh, now, in your book, uh, like you've just mentioned, you've argued that the Roman Catholic Church was instrumental in creating some of the conditions that made the West uh, unique and peculiar as it did. Uh, in today's society, in, in most parts of the Western world, uh, we have a myriad of different religions at play here. Do you think then the core nucleus of uh, what made Western society unique then is eroding? Well, that's possible. Um, it's certainly the case, though, that a bunch of the practices that were initially imposed or uh, fostered or encouraged by the Roman Catholic Church became part of people's secular ways of thinking. So after the Protestant Reformation, Protestantism uh, didn't have these taboos on cousin marriage and whatnot, 
But what happened is they began, they were imposed uh, secularly. So for example, in the US, as European descent populations were expanding across the US, uh, cousin marriage began to pop up in various places and sta different states at different times imposed cousin marriage. So some, some, econ some economists at the University of British Columbia uh, ha have analyzed this and shown that the states that imposed uh, these bans on cousin marriage were able to create greater prosperity among um, groups that were otherwise pretty high in cousin marriage. So in other words, this is a case where an initially a religious set of beliefs becomes part of the secular institutions. The same thing with the bans on polygynous marriage. Uh, so lo lots of, and, and those bans have been imported all around the world to reduce the number of wives that high status and elite males have, which creates a bunch of downstream, um, uh, some benefits for society. So you have, you don't have this pool of low status unmarried men that uh, cause problems essentially. I've heard the argument from some people and pundits and that uh, the Western society as we used to know it is in decline in some way, either morally or uh, ethically or economically or socially, politically, um, you know, however you want to look at it. Do you agree with any of this? Well, I think we have evidence. Uh, so I, um, uh, people in my laboratory, researchers in my laboratory, as well as my colleague Ben Anke over in economics at Harvard, uh, has taken advantage of an uh, of a online data source put together by two psychologists, Jonathan Haidt and Jesse Graham. And since 2008, people from all over the world, including the United States, have been answering these questionnaires. It's called Moral Foundations Theory or Moral Foundations Questionnaires. And this just gives you a picture of people's morality. And what you're able to do from this data is for each person who takes it is to kind of get a measure of how morally universalistic they are, focused on you know, all humans being equal moral actors versus moral parochialism, where people are quite biased towards say their small town or the people who live in their neighborhood or their families, as opposed to uh, just anybody in the world. And you can see in the US that the rural areas and the urban areas have begun to divide. So the rural areas have gotten increasingly morally parochial and the urban areas have gotten a little bit more or maybe about the same amount of moral universalism. So there's this growing divide and you can use that to predict things like voting for Donald Trump in 2016 and 2020 over and above the factors that, uh, this is Ben Anke's famous result, um, over and above the factors that political economists would usually use. So the demographics and things like that. Sorry, back up a bit. What, what do you mean by moral universalism? Can you define that for us? Sure. So uh, these psychologists have developed this theory called moral foundations theory. And essentially, it's an empirical description of people's morality. And so uh, two foundations would be fairness and care. Uh, and so people, that's how much people weight they put on things related to care, how much uh, weight they put on things like justice and fairness. And then there's domains like uh, in-group loyalty um, and purity and other. And so you can kind of compress these different dimensions of morality into two dimensions that one tends to cluster around the moral universalism, concerned with fair, fairness and justice, uh, care, and then another one that's concerned with, say, in-group loyalty, uh, purity, and you know, there's, there's one other dimension that's not important. Um, and so that gives you this unilineal dimension, and this varies now across the U.S. US in an expanding uh, difference. So uh, because U.S. is becoming more morally parochial, at least in some regions. Can you make the generalization that urban centers usually have populations that are uh, a little more collective uh, in their collectivist in your thinking and their in their approach uh, well, as opposed I, to uh, rural areas? Yeah, I, I, I want to resist uh, the word collectivism because I think it could be it's used in many different ways and it has very different meanings. But uh, the urban areas are more morally universalistic. And I could just give you a concrete example. So one of the things that uh, Anki does is he just asks people where they want to give money to, and he provides money. So this is actual money being transferred. You can give money to your local firefighters, or you can give money to poor kids in Africa. And if you're more morally universalistic, you're more inclined to give money to the poor kids in Africa or Central Asia, or you know, pick your favorite poor country, uh, versus uh, your local firefighters. And so that's where the moral parochialists want to go. They want to keep it local, and the other folks are more inclined to give it further away. Does that does that partly explain uh, funding allocations to foreign wars as opposed to helping people in the country? 
Yeah, I mean, that's the kind of thing as a, as a degree to which you're more focused on the details of what's going on in your local county or state or country versus you have more of a global perspective on things. Going into practical applications of your research, if an investor were to say, uh, Professor uh, Henrik, how do we determine or decide if a particular country or group of countries is going to become prosperous or maintain its prosperity over the coming decades, which cultural and or perhaps economic or social indicators should we look at to determine uh, levels of prosperity into the future? How would you answer that? Well, I mean, the kinds of variables we've looked at, well, I mentioned family structure. So um, we and we so we have a snapshot of family structure, say around 1900, and this is at a pretty fine grain level of sort of the ethno linguistic group, and we have that for the entire globe. We can link that to prosperity in 2010. So places that have smaller, more monogamous nuclear families, as opposed to the big networks, have more uh, satellite luminosity, which is a proxy for global prosperity. So looking at how what's happening with the organizations of families would be an important. Trust in strangers is a big one. So economists have spent a lot of time in this, and there's some good measure or some at least global measurements of it. And this seems to be linked with both innovation and the sort of performance of economies. Because to, to be an entrepreneur, to innovate, you have to share ideas, you have to interact with others, you have to trust people. So you have to have people who are trusting and trustworthy in order to make the economy go. Um, things like individualism are associated with innovation. So if you're looking for somewhere that's innovative, you want places that are high on innovation, low on conformity, high in trust, uh, that kind of mixture of things. Is trust a fundamentally cultural phenomenon? I mean, I ask this because if you look at um, places where just colloquially speaking, people have the least amount of trust, it's where in areas where there's high levels of crime, crime usually is correlated with income. The higher the income, the less crime and vice versa. So could you just make the connection that richer countries tend to have people who are more trusting of strangers? Well, you're going to get that. But the way you can get around this in terms of figuring out whether a culture's uh, trust is culturally transmitted is to look at immigrants from different places. So, for example, you can look at immigrants to the United States and see where they've come from. And then you can predict their trust value as, as it comes out in a survey or in an experiment uh, based on where they came from. And you find that even second generation immigrants you, if you know where their parents came from, you can say something about their, their trustworthiness. So there's stuff being culturally transmitted for sure, in addition to responding to the current environment. Uh, but, you know, humans are a cultural species. We look to our communities and our parents and others to give us a signal about the kind of world we're going to live in. How does trust translate to business success, generally speaking? Yeah, so uh, we think about entrepreneurism or coming up with a good idea. So uh, lots of good ideas are forged when individuals get together and swap ideas. So something like, um, there's a great study by the economist Mike Andrews uh, on prohibition. So in the United States, you get national level prohibition in uh, 1919. Prior to that, states began to impose, impose prohibition at the state level. And not intuitively, what Andrews shows is that when prohibition hits, the saloons close and patents go down. And you might say, well, gosh, people are drinking less. You might expect they have more brain power. Maybe patents would go up. That's not where patents come from or creativity. It comes from the swapping of idea amongst individuals. And so they have no, they don't meet in the saloon. So the ideas never get created and the, the idea never gets patented. Uh, and so there's lots of different lines of evidence that demonstrate that same effect. You mentioned that, um, uh, you know, individuals or people who are more individualistic tend to want to do things differently. Can we ever really do anything differently? I mean, I've heard the argument that all our actions are influenced by um, things that have already been done or other people's thoughts. And so it's very rare to come up with something that's truly original. Yeah. So there's there's two two different ways to think about it. One is you could be taking ideas that are rarely used and then recombining them. This is opposed to someone who is conformist, who is trying to do the most frequent thing. The most common thing. So a simple way that people measure this is they look at uh, the first names given to babies. So a lot of people want to give their baby a common name that will be shared by lots of people in the community. Other people want to come up with a name from some mythology or from a society very different from their own or create some new recombinant name that mixes together two previous names. So that's the you see you can see the differences in this kinds of strategies you would use in something like baby naming. 
the U.S. in particular has more billionaires and multimillionaires than any other country in the world. In fact, I believe it has more billionaires than every other country put together. Uh, is that something to do with the culture or is that just the, 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 the matter of fact of the economy itself? Well, I mean, there's lots of things that would, are going to go into that fact, but it is the case that innovation is one of the major drivers of productivity and of you know wealth creation. So anything that includes high levels of trust, the U.S. tradition doesn't it's actually has declining level of trust right now, but traditionally it had relatively high levels of trust, high levels of individualism, and of course the kind of institutional environments that will let those things be taken advantage of. So. So, so within the last few decades, the U.S. patent system has developed a lot of problems. But traditionally, it was uh, a better patent system than many other places had. So it also had some institutional uh, advantages. Right now, we're living the AI revolution. Um, we, one could probably envision a future where robots take over a lot of our work. Um, there are several industries already that are seeing a shift. If we're seeing a future where you interact with a non-human entity, does that disrupt our entire belief system, our, our our way of life? Does that disrupt this element of trust you're talking about? I mean, how can I trust a computer more or less than a human being? Does it even matter at that point? Well, I mean, I think it is a, a an important worry. So one of the things that I think has cultivated trust is that if you have mutually beneficial interactions with other real living people, you start to develop the cues you look at, the kinds of things you watch for, you know, you're, you're cultivating uh, trustworthy practices and appearance and reputations related to that. Uh, and that leads people to actually be trusting and trustworthy. Um, some of our technology is actually removing the need for trust. So a simple example of this is, it used to be when you took a taxi cab, the taxi cab driver had to trust that you would pay him at the end of the ride. And, you know, maybe give them a tip or stuff, but at least pay them. No money was exchanged when you first got in the taxi. Now with something like Uber or these other ride services, you they, you know, they have your credit card, right? And, and you can't even get in the vehicle unless they've already had your credit card and they're, they've charged it. Uh, so, uh, so that removes any kind of trust, right? It's all completely perfectly contracted. Um, so, so that may actually reduce our trust despite the sort of seemingly um, touchlessness of the, of the interaction. And um and then I think that AI could be a powerful source of greater innovation and recombination because these AIs are trained on large corpuses of human knowledge and human interaction. So they may be pow powerful at generating new recombinations and, and helping people generate new recombinations and creativity and innovation and whatnot. Um, Can we use your research and extrapolate whether a country will be more or less prosperous depending on how much AI they adopt? I mean, I think there's two ways to, well, there's several ways to look at it, but there's two ways that I'll bring to your attention. One is that, like you said, AI can massively boost productivity in a nation, or it could make us complacent relying on technology rather than developing skills that are, that are you know, that are maybe not needed when our computers are doing our work for us. Uh, how would you interpret this? Well, I think that, uh, well, I, I have no, I, this is not something I've spent much time on trying to predict which country is going to adopt AI technology better. Uh, but I do think that the name of the game is going to be uh, figuring out how to retrain the workforce to team up with AI and uh, make best use of it rather than um, resist it. Finally, I want to move on to um, developing or emerging superpowers. Now, uh, some argue that uh, uh, some members of the BRICS nations, Brazil, Russia, India, China, South, Af South Africa, could uh, compete with the U.S. in the global stage, entering a multipolar world, some argue. Now, these countries that I mentioned are distinctly non-Western, uh, also in their cultures. So my question is simply, do you think the BRICS nations will succeed in supplanting the U.S. at any given point, despite their cultural differences? Yeah. And I mean, I think one of the, so the approach I take is a cultural evolutionary approach. And you could see part of it when I was describing uh, how to think about Japan. And so, you know, uh, peoples are always swapping ideas with other communities. So lots of ideas from Europe have spread out and recombined with ideas uh, of how to do things in other places. So what we have is a whole bunch of experiments where different places are trying different institutional combinations mixed with different kinds of cultural beliefs. And it's really hard to say which one will emerge and which one will eventually uh, win out or, you know, if any of them win out. Um, 
one thing we can be sure is that empires always collapse and and leading nations always eventually fail, right? So that's the that's the lesson of history. Can you can you speculate as to uh, which areas of the world will continue to lead in innovation? Would it still be the West? Uh, will it be the East? Maybe somewhere in between. Uh, well, if I was just to make a wild speculation from history, it will be somewhere on the borderlands of the West, Westish. Westish. All yeah. right. Um, okay, this has been a fascinating talk, uh, Professor. Where can we learn more about your work? Well, tell us about some of the things that you're working on right now that maybe we haven't had a chance to discuss yet. Yeah, I mean, the big thing that I'm working on now is this idea of the collective brain. And within the context of human evolution, I developed the notion that, you know, I talked about cumulative cultural evolution earlier in our discussion. And that's this idea that um, what drives humans and allows them to adapt to diverse environments is that each generation takes the ideas from the previous generation and fixes them up a bit or tries them out in new ways and gets a little bit better adapted to the environment. And when you take this point of view, what really drives innovation is larger and more interconnected uh, populations. The, the idea here is that the more you can bring together diverse ideas, the more innovative and creative you can be. And in my 2020 book, The Weirdest People in the World, I use this to explain why the Industrial Revolution occurs in uh, Europe and specifically in England. And there's a bunch of interesting contextual circumstances and technological changes, cultural changes that, are, that, that cause that, that cause Europe to have a large collective brain and really proliferate on the innovation front. And then in, in my latest book that I'm working on now, I'm trying to put all those lessons together and think about what leads to innovation across history and in the modern world from just pairs of people working together to small teams all the way up to the level of continents. Uh, so when you say collective brain, is that just another way of saying collaboration or societies that are more collaborative? Uh, well, it means more flow among uh, diverse minds. Okay. So, I mean, the saloons of the of uh, earlier era were a place where people got together and swapped ideas, and that led to a more interconnected collective brain. So that 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 lends to another interesting topic, which I'll bring it to your attention now, which is the work from home culture that's proliferated ever since the pandemic. Do you believe then that um, society overall is at a disadvantage if we all stay at home and work? on our computers rather than mingle in an office and exchange ideas in person? Yeah, I mean, that's that's where the research is, is demonstrating also. I mean, there are a lot of advantages to remote work and it allows experts who live very far apart to contribute to joint projects. So it's great for small incremental cumulative science. Uh, it's bad for breakthrough science um, because you need to like bump into someone at the copy machine or at the coffee machine or all the various serendipitous ways that big ideas are created. Is there any, do we need human physical contact for this? Or are there other technological uh, workarounds like this? Like perhaps we can all plug in virtually through a metaverse or. Yeah. You know. um, at this point, it doesn't look like there's a workaround, but that doesn't mean we won't figure out a workaround. It could be that there will be virtual coffee shops, but okay. um, not yet. Uh, finally, Professor, uh, how does cultural differences lend to differences in uh, economic thoughts and ideologies? So capitalism versus socialism, for example, do we see a, a more of a concentration of capitalist societies in, let's say, democratic countries? Is that a cultural issue um, versus socialist countries uh, having adopted different cultures? Is, is, this, is this fundamentally a cultural difference is, is what I'm asking? Yeah, I mean, I think one of the problems with the way we think about these things is we like to put things into a box. So if you look at a university, you have an ex economics department, a political science department, and then you have cultural studies and you have anthropology or something. But really these things are one big soup, right? So the things that lead to politics are often related to religion um, and they're often affected by economic changes. So you really need to think about them as an integrated system. So something like, uh, I mean, myself and Jonathan Schultz, who's an economist at George Mason, has shown that you know having these small monogamous nuclear families I mentioned leads to democracy to be more effective and collective action among strangers to be more effective. So yeah, there are there are connections between what people believe about what a good family is uh, and and democracy versus autocracy. But going back into history, some of the biggest empires were not democracies. So can we can we still can we looking forward can we make the conclusion that a democracy is not uh, a condition for economic success? Well, certainly in the past, successful societies haven't been democracies, uh, at least not by and large. Uh, 
Um, and whether there's a configuration of institutions and beliefs and cultures that can allow a non-democracy to compete economically with democracies remains to be seen. I don't think we know the answer to that question. Okay. Where can we learn more about you and read your work currently, Professor? Yeah. So if you Google me, Joseph Henrik, uh, you'll find my website. Uh, my, my 2020 book is The Weirdest People in the World, available at your local booksellers. Mm -hmm. And uh, the, the Secret of Our Success is my 2016 book. So if you're going to read both, start with the older one. Start with the 2016 one. All right. We'll put the links down below in the uh, from Amazon. Thank you very much, Professor, for enlightening us. Great talk. All right. Thanks, David. Thank you. And don't forget to like and subscribe.